Um, so I want to introduce uh, Sheriff uh, Adrian Garcia um, of Harris County. Um, <clears throat> I first actually, um, I, I'm from, originally from Houston um, and uh, was uh, in Houston at the time when he was first elected and, and then had the opportunity to work for Mental Health of Mental Health America of Greater Houston as a Hog Policy Fellow um, back in 2010. And when I first started, uh, got uh, swiftly uh, connected with <clears throat> the Sheriff's uh, Mental Health Task Force, which he um, created when he um, first was elected to the Sheriff's office, uh, position there in Harris County. Um, and, and the fact that you have a Sheriff who creates a Mental Health Task Force when he's first elected, um, really is indicative of his um, his his intent to really um, serve individuals with a mental illness and ensure that they're not getting back and you know I think all jails have their ups and downs but I think um, what he has to share <clears throat> in having his perspective is going to be really insightful that he's really trying to create an opportunity for individuals to one not come back into his jail system and two when they when they do come into his jail system that they're treated well and that they're they're able to transition out um, successfully um, so I have a uh, um, so I'm so pl uh, so pleased that he's able to join us here today to talk about some of the challenges, some of the uh, opportunities of serving individuals with uh, lived experience of mental illness and substance use in a correctional system. And so thank you so much, Sheriff Garcia, for coming today. My pleasure. Thank, thank you so very much. And I really uh, want to applaud the center for getting us all together. And, and thank you for this very, very important uh, and fruitful conversation. Um, you know, and, and to, uh, where's Tuesday? Where, where's she run off to? There you are, Tuesday. Uh, you know, as I always tell people, <clears throat> you know, the county jail doesn't have the best food, it doesn't have the best beds, the company's not the greatest, but for some reason people kept coming back. <laughs> We're, we would love to have you back, uh, but not in uh, in your previous capacity. And so, thank you. It really wasn't. <laughs> we, we, tried to do, we tried to do good. We tried to do good in that regard. Uh, but, you know, to, to that end, and, and uh, the reason this is, this is so, so important is that uh, too often, uh, we leave out the perspective of those individuals who understand the system and the challenges the best. And uh, I'll get into some of this a little later, but just as, just as a perspective, um, we have a young lady, similar story, similar uh, uh, experience of challenges uh, that uh, she dealt with and, and overcame. and. Uh, we created a program around her experiences and her ability to reach people. And that program is now referred to as Been There, Done That. In the time that her program has been in place, working with uh, women who have been exploited into the sex trade, uh, she in, uh, in about three years is, uh, is hitting something like an 85% success rate. Wow. And, uh, and it's, I think everything that surrounds the program is a, is a, obviously contributes to that success, but I think the greatest part of this, that success is her. And so, because uh, we can all say the same things, but unless you really can demonstrate uh, that you've been there and done that, uh, does it uh, sometimes hit people uh, in the right nerve to realize, to help them realize they have the capacity uh, to turn things around uh, themselves. So with that, once again, thank you to the Hog uh, Foundation and everyone involved for getting this conversation together. Uh, and then with all that we've been discussing, all the opportunities, all the challenges, and really with all the challenges in front of us, everybody, uh, we know there's great opportunities, but uh, we've got to work together as a unified uh, voice, uh, as a unified front, uh, to get our darn state uh, to get us out of that 49th or 50th place. Uh, wherever we're at, it, it's the wrong place. Texas is known for leading. Uh, we ought to lead from the front and not from the rear. And so when you have the state of Maine, who per capita outspends us 10 times, uh, that is ridiculous. And so 
I, you know, I continue to be a uh, confrontational voice on this issue uh, because it just ain't right. And as you just mentioned, that uh, every jail has its ups and downs. I got mine uh, right now in with a uh, mentally ill inmate. But uh, the greatest injustice uh, surrounding that circumstance and any other uh, that may be happening in any other facility is the fact that they should not be coming to jail just because they're sick. And, uh, and then it's, and it's compounded by the fact that, you know, one of the challenges that we have today in Texas, and I think we're one of the few states that, uh, that uh, contributes or, or, or works in this regard, is that when folks spend at least uh, 29 days or more in the county jail, your Medicaid is uh, terminated. terminated. Not suspended like other states do, but terminated. And then we tell you, go reapply and requalify. And uh, and and then when we you know we we spend an incredible amount of money stabilizing folks, treating them, doing all that we can to treat them uh, with uh, respect and dignity, just to have them leave and fall into the environment and the circumstances that got them there to begin with. And let's assume that they want to continue their pathway of recovery. But without Medicaid and access to that, uh, to those services, uh, then they're going to be, they're going to have greater access to alcohol or some other uh, form of self-medication and treatment. That's wrong. That's just flat out wrong. And uh, we need to, we need to fix that. And so, um, part of you know the you know when I came into office, <clears throat> I did form a mental health task force. The chair of that is a gentleman you may be familiar with by the name of uh, George Parnum. George Parnum was the defense attorney for a young lady by the name of Andrea Yates. Andrea Yates, uh, if you know her story, uh, uh, you know went through a very horrific uh, experience. Her and her family. Uh, but George, I asked him to chair that for me because when I served on city council prior to becoming the sheriff, uh, he and I had had a lot of conversations about some of the challenges that were occurring between police officers and the mentally ill out in the streets. One case in particular that got my attention when I was on council was the fact that uh, we had a Houston officer uh, get involved in a deadly confrontation with a mentally ill person. And when you heard the conversation coming from that family, uh, the, the conversation was a little bit like this. For the number of times that the police had been called to our home, for the num different number of officers who have had to come to the house over that period of time, for the number of times in a day that different officers had had to come uh, to deal with our loved one, how could this officer not know that you know we had someone who was sick? And that really got my attention. So I did a little bit of an anatomy, if you will, on that particular incident. And sure enough, we had been responding to that location several times, sometimes several times in a day. And what, what law enforcement has been using across the state is crisis intervention training, which is effectively a de-escalation strategy. Calm down. Everything's going to be all right. Take your meds. You know. Um, you don't have to, I'm not going to take you away. And that was working. It was working because every time the officer showed up, they de-escalate, then go on about their business. The problem was is that we left that person there to deteriorate until de-escalation no longer was effective. And then regretfully, the confrontation got to a point where uh, the options became much more limited and, uh, and decisions had to be uh, much more quicker and uh, there was greater uh, threat to uh, uh, threat of harm uh, occurring. And so I created, I, I got the county together, I got our law enforcement uh, uh, leaders together and we talked about this. And it occurred to me that, look, if we listen to this family that law enforcement, you know, dropped the ball on this, assuming that that's accurate and I, and I make a difference in that regard. But assuming that the argument that law enforcement dropped the ball on this was somewhere accurate, then the question was to me, 
why are we calling the people least qualified to contend with this person? We have trained our society that if you have someone in crisis, you call what number, folks? And that's effectively attached to my office. And every other police agency you know, across the community. So how do you expect to get mental health care when you're calling the cops? And in spite of giving officers all kinds of training, you're, you still have a cop. And you're, you know, if you still want them to get, you know, right now we say get 24 hours and some agencies like ours give 40 and some of them do 60. And, but at the end of the day, when you're still trying to fit that round peg in that square hole, you still have a cop. Some may do it well, things may work out, but it's not the way it ought to be. So the Chronic Consumer Stabilization Initiative was effectively designed to get cops out of the framework, out of the formula. But rather, when someone were to call 911, uh, and a, the initial responding officer or the call takers, one of the, one of the things I, I, I did was have the call takers trained on understanding the circumstances that were that, that, that was taking place so that they can get those, the right people going at the very beginning. And then to do case management initially, right off the bat. Get the cops out of the way, get case management started, <coughs> uh, start providing care, start providing treatment, not just calm people down and then let them percolate. And so, uh, interestingly enough that, you know, uh, Mayor White, who I served with on council at the time, thought uh, that it wasn't necessarily our place to kind of develop this kind of framework. And I said, Mayor, I, we're using city cops. And although it's a county issue and a state issue, we're using city cops. And he understood, he agreed, and uh, we began to move forward in that regard. I got elected sheriff, and then the Houston Police Department won a national award behind that program. <laughs> <laughs> but the county now has outpaced the city in the number of uh, uh, crisis intervention response teams uh, uh, in, in our short time. Uh, that I've been sure. All this to say is that part of my challenge is that I have, uh, regretfully, the largest mental health care provider in the state of Texas. Mm -hmm. I want to get out from under that distinction. Uh, but until we get the issue with Medicaid resolved, until we get the legislators to uh, support more jail diversion uh, programs up front, and until we get uh, MHMRA, uh, the funding, uh, and hopefully dishes will have uh, some leadership capacity to get us there. Uh, but until we get out of the business that in the free world you can only get diagnosed for the big three, major depression, schizophrenia, and, uh, and bipolar disorder, uh, and you get treatment for everything inside my jail, that has to be changed. Uh, it doesn't make any sense. Uh, and so we can get parents to stop making uh, strategic decisions, like stories I've heard in my community where the principal of a prominent middle school said, I'm gonna leave my son in jail because that's where he's gonna get the right treatment. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and that's wrong. That's wrong for parents and families to have to think that way. So, and look, you know, we've tried to be uh, very holistic in all of the respective challenges. I have a jail that I want to fill with bad people People who, uh, within all of their uh, wherewithal, know that they're pulling a gun and a knife on someone. Uh, they're making uh, decisions to rob banks and, you know, hurt children and families. I want my jailhouse to be full of those individuals if they're out there. Uh, but veterans who aren't getting, even through the resources of the VA, who can't get the proper treatment for uh, post-traumatic stress disorder, uh, they're finding their way to my county jail. And yet, we're providing the treatment that even our nation's finest can't get uh, out in the free world or even through the VA. And so we're working uh, to deal with our veterans. As I mentioned, uh, the women who have been exploited into the sex trade, we're working to get them uh, moving in a better direction. Uh, and then mothers with children, uh, we're trying to get them uh, the proper uh, support so that their kids don't have to grow up seeing them in orange jumpsuits. And the list goes on. This is, you know, when I took over the jail, 
my fundamental uh, reform ideology for the county jail was that uh, I don't want to see the inmates again. You know, we hold graduations, mm -hmm. whether it's for their GED or their vocational programs. I'm always a keynote. <laughs> and I'm always, uh, I always tell them, congratulations, but I never want to see you again, <laughs> uh, at least not here. And, and, uh, and so the reentry commitment that we have made, because think about it, most of the reentry uh, initiatives that have been uh, provided or that are provided are at the present level. Uh, when you've committed a serious offense. And so we're trying to give people uh, the reentry services and support so that they don't go on to commit graduated offenses and then truly uh, stop their opportunity for, uh, for a better life once they leave our facilities. And, and to Tuesday and to others uh, like her and like Catherine that is in my facility, when I worked to bring Catherine into uh, the walls of our uh, program to do her work, <clears throat> there was an incredible backlash by the staff. Sure, she's got a criminal record. She's got a long one. And I go, I imagine she does. Uh, but we've got to be willing and strong enough to give uh, these kinds of programs, these kinds of strategies, this kind of perspective, uh, the opportunity uh, when we see that everything else is failing. Uh, we've got to be willing to try uh, other initiatives. But at the end of the day, I'll get back to dishes. Uh, I kick them in the shins uh, because they need to do better. They have so much money, uh, and they have so much uh, within uh, their realm that affects this population, this very tender and delicate population, that we need to uh, push them uh, to figure it out, get that money to the places that it needs to be, uh, and quit making county jails the place where the mentally ill uh, get the best and in, in, uh, proper care. So in closing, I'll just tell you that with all the concepts of peer support, we're working with uh, MHMRA on this. Uh, there's opportunity to expand on that. We'll be happy to sit down and work through that because I think it's already proven to be valuable and it is uh, worth exploring and expanding if it proves fruitful in that regard. So thank you. So if there's any, any questions, I guess we'll have a little later. Yeah. Thank you. So uh, we have, we're going to wait for our, our questions, <laughs> start them down, <laughs> so that uh, we can uh, move on and, and uh, hear from Leon Evans, who is the um, the executive director of the City Center for Health Services. Services in Bear County. And uh, I'm trying to, I'm not going to be able to do that. Um, so 